Welcome everyone. I'm Elizabeth Goldstein, president of the Municipal Arts Society. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for this virtual gallery talk, exploring our most recent uh, exhibition at the Friedman Gallery, Summer in the Bronx by photographer Edwin Torres. Before we begin, I'd like to direct your attention to the chat where MAS staff have placed some helpful in, uh, hints indicating information about closed captioning for today's program. If you need any assistance during this program, feel free to message MAS using the chat function. And throughout the event, we invite you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to ask questions of our speaker. We will address those questions during the conversation portion of this event. This afternoon, we're meeting with Edwin Torres, the photographer featured uh, in the current show. The, photograph the photographs in this show were shot between 2013 and 2016 and depict the season when the city's public realm comes most alive, when New Yorkers inevitably find themselves out in the streets alongside one another in gatherings, both planned and incidental. I can't wait for us to hear more about our artist, um, how this artist captured the energy and joy of summertime in this work. Mr. Torres is an award-winning photographer. He graduated from Colby College with a degree in American Studies, which sparked his intellectual curiosity about history, current events, and the representation of cultures in a variety of media. Currently, he serves as the digital director for the governor's office in New Jersey, Prior, he served as a staff photographer the New York, for the New York City Mayor's Office. And prior to his work in government, Torres was a freelance uh, photojournalist. In 2016, he was the lead photographer and contributed reporting in a Pulitzer Prize winning story with ProPublica and the New York Daily News. He also spent five years volunteering at the Bronx Documentary Center, a nonprofit organization that utilizes documentary practice and education to explore vital issues, stimulate critical thought, and drive social change. His work has been published in the New York Times, Vice, The Atlantic, The, da the New York Daily News, The American Prospect, ProPublica, and several other publications. You can follow Edwin on Instagram at Edward Torres Photo. We are honored to have Edwin's uh, work grace our virtual gallery, and I now welcome him to take it away and dive deeper into his exhibition. Later, I will, I will join Edwin for a conversation about his practice process and where he gets his inspiration for his compelling and lively photographs. Please take it away, Edwin. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, very honored to be here today. Um, you know, when I was given this opportunity to talk about my work, um, I was just very excited. I, you know, you take thousands of photographs throughout your career and rarely do you get a chance to look back and, and, uh, and talk about them in detail. So, um, I'm happy to talk about my body of work in general. Um, you know, I guess just briefly touching on the idea that um, a lot of these photographs I took, um, you know, I was born and raised in the Bronx. And a lot of these photographs I took while I was either on assignment or out and about walking around, commuting around the Bronx, I pretty much always carried a camera with me. Um, so I, you know, I saw these moments as they were coming up naturally. Um, during this particular time frame, I was uh, working with the New York Times on a series of, uh, you know, uh, stories related to crime and homicide in the very neighborhood that I grew up. And I was surrounded by a lot of like negative, um, you know, news and, uh, and moments. And I guess psychologically, I turned to my camera in making these images in a way of focusing also on the positive and on the daily life moments that make the Bronx the Bronx. Um, so uh, I, I'll take you closely in detail through these images. Um, starting with this uh, title image right here. Um, I grew up in Hunts Point um, on Simpson Street. And uh, this photo was taken, um, you know, uh, right by the East River. Um, you know, I was in Barreto Point Park and I was exploring the area. I hadn't been there in a long time. Um, I saw that there was a little stretch of land, you know, uh, going off from the official park. Um, and I was like, is that open? And I saw a bunch of kids, you know, uh, running back there with their bicycles and stuff. And I just, I followed them. I was like 24, 25 at the time. 
they were like 15, I think, or 14, maybe even a little younger. Um, and they were just hanging out by the port or not a port, but like there was a, there, there was a, yeah, there was like a small, you know, little dock that they were jumping off of the dock and into the water. I'm like, wow, I would never do that as a Bronx resident to just jump off this dock into like the water in the East River. Like, is that water even safe? Like, are they like, you know, do they even know what's up? And it seemed like they had been doing it before and this was like their hangout spot. Um, so this is when I made this image right here. You know, uh, one of the kids just jumped right before me into the frame actually. Um, I was taking a picture of the kids in the water and the moment just pulled itself together. Um, and I particularly love the way the silhouettes and the shadows um, and taking flight, you know, like it just poetically fell into place with his arms, you know, spread out uh, like that. And, and actually in the background, you'll see a boat that's actually a pool that's usually open, um, at, you know, in that time, uh, like a public pool that people can go and swim so i you know i thought it was maybe the pool was closed that day i'm not sure but i was like it, it's interesting that they're they're choosing to just jump off this little dock um and just climbing back up they had like a little ladder too it was it reminded me I, my family's from puerto rico and it reminded me from you know a moment in puerto rico where you know folks are just jumping off the dock and also reminded me of one of those very iconic new york city images um, I can't remember the photographer, but, you know, it's, it was back in the 40s or 50s and there's kids jumping off a dock, you know, whether either it's in the Hudson or the East River, I can't recall, but, you know, it was like, this is very familiar, this moment. So, um, yeah, let's take it to the next image. Um, passing inspection on West, Westchester Avenue. So, you know, there's... A lot of these photographs are about the space, but also the people and the way they navigate these spaces. Um, you know, as I was photographing the Bronx, I I have like a uh, a map in my brain just from childhood of you know all of these places that I had crossed, either my parents driving through in a car, me looking out of the a window, or or taking the bus myself to go to school, or taking the train. Um, and, you know, this intersection is one that I had walked past many times, um, but it's also like ingrained in my memory as like, just like a space that's in inhabited that, um, you know, people don't usually like, the, it's just an intersection, you know, behind the camera, there's a highway. Um, and in front of me, there's apartment buildings and, um, you know, auto repair shops. And it's just something that's so timeless, you know, we, we feel like, you know, I feel like I've seen this image before, um, you know, of these iconic buildings and these um, car mechanic auto repair stores in the South Bronx. Um, and, you know, I was photographing the space and I saw this, inc this classic car driving by and I'm like, classic car and iconic space, it's going to make us feel like we're in like the, in the seventies, you know, um, <laughs> or the sixties, or I th actually, I think that car's from like early sixties. Um, so, you know, this, this is one of those moments where it's really about, um, the space, a space that's common to me and probably many others that see it, but doesn't usually get photographed because it's, it's nothing really, it's nothing special unless you pay particular attention to it then you start seeing, um, you know, all the texture and the details and the way the light comes in. Um, all right, let's take it to the next one. Puerto Rican Americans. Um, this was actually taken, uh, you know, um, in the South Bronx uh, during the summer, right after the Puerto Rican Day Parade. So all of New York was booming with uh, celebrating Puerto Rican culture. And this was, you know, at like a small Puerto Rican community center um, where they had a small house that was very similar to, you know, a small house you'd find on the island. Um, and they were doing everything. They were, you know, cooking pork, roasting um, pelnil, and, and the kids were running around and um, there was music and people were running around and, um, 
you know, I had seen, I, I, I saw the, uh, you know, the, the American flag and the Puerto Rican flag and, um, and these kids were just sharing chairs, you know? And so I just, you know, I, I was like, this is just beautiful. You know, this is the future, you know, pretty much we're all going to be mixed someday, you know? So, um, I thought it was just a really beautiful template and moment with the, you know, the different, uh, skin tones of the kids and the two flags and, you know, we're all in the seat, sh sharing the seats together and stuff. And I was like, something this complex needs to be shot very simple, very straight on. Um, so I just saw that composition and geometry and just, you know, took a simple photograph from the front. Um, and of course I try to get their attention, but kids are going to be kids. So, all right, what's next? <laughs> Uh, this photograph was taken in the Mott Haven um, neighborhood of the South Bronx. Uh, I walk around a lot and I hang around a lot, or at least in this time I did. Um, you know, if I wasn't on assignment shooting for the newspaper, I was out and about with my backpack, two cameras and a laptop um, taking pictures. And this was something as simple as me walking down the sidewalk um you know seeing these guys hanging out and the dog and i was like man that's a big dog is it cool if i take a photo of your dog and he turns around he's like oh this dog sure and the dog just like jumps up you know on him and like gives him a hug and i don't think they were trying i don't think he was like there was nothing posed about it i wasn't like hug your dog or anything like that's just how it was you know and uh and it was cool because you expect these guys to be like very, um, you know, in New York, you're, 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 you're often uh, given a lot of, um, you know, moments where you don't expect, you don't know what to do. Like you, you, you don't know how folks are going to, you know, react. So I wasn't ex expecting this guy to be like so friendly or like the, the bonds be so like loving and mutual. And like, you know, he showed this certain like tenderness all of a sudden, because as I was walking up, it was just three guys like hanging out hanging out against the fence and stuff, you know? And I was like, all right, well, these guys are either gonna give me a problem or they're gonna let me take their photo, you know? And sure enough, once I called out the dog and the dog already knew what was up. So, um, you know, it was, just a, it was just a beautiful moment, you know? Um, and, and that's one of the things that happens in New York is you don't expect something to happen and it happens. It catches you by surprise um, and, and and that, I, I think that's one of the reasons a lot of people love the city, you know. Um, there's always something this something that can happen that you don't always expect. It's very exciting in that sense. All right, next. Um, fitness among legends. Um, this is uh, this is what we call this is right by the Yankee Stadium, obviously, as you can see in the background. Um, you know, these guys called themselves the Brotherhood. I actually like I ran into them. How did it how did it start? Did I see them or did I start working out with them? At one point I was working out with them. Um, that's how like uh, how interesting their personality was, you know. But I I actually at first I was walking through the park and I saw these guys working out and I'm like, wow, that's like really intense. Um, and the level of competition and fierceness amongst these men was on par of like, you know, like the Olympics. And the moment I saw this image here I knew I was like wow that's like that's like fine gymnastics in a New York City like park by the Yankee Stadium that nobody's like paying attention to or filming or or even you know like looking at this stuff except me and I was there um, and this was a uh, this is very routine this was very common um, part of the workout regimens they would learn to balance on one arm two arms um, and just like the form of you know, the human body and what they can do was just, was just really special, compelling, captivating. Um, so much to the point that, you know, I, I stuck around, like oftentimes in street photography, it's just one and done. You meet someone, you have a conversation, you take a picture and you move on. Um, in this situation, I found myself coming back and really building a relationship um, I got to know a lot of the guys by name. I started hanging out there every couple of days. I started filming video. 
Um, I started taking photographs and out of the many images that I chose that I took there, I, I grabbed this one because it's just like his shorts, you know, the shoes, uh, the iconic stadium in the background. Again, it's a very timeless moment. There aren't too many distractions going on. Um, it's just pure technique and athleticism. And I was like, that's, that's, uh, that's worthy to be among legends in front of the Yankee stadium to me on a photograph. So next. All right. Um, we all love the classic fire hydrant, right? Um, you know, in New York City, we've seen this moment many times, but this was like something out of like a movie because these kids were actually operating a car wash and, you know, it was the middle of the summer. It was hot, you know, um, they probably wanted a job, but we're looking for some extra money to just like, I don't know, have fun in the summer. And um, I remember, no, I was in the bus. I, I was riding the bus, um, you know, and I jumped off of this bus. I was on my way commuting to something to photograph this moment. And I spent like 25 minutes with these kids getting to know them. And, um, you know, I returned at a later, on another day too, to also hang out with them and like keep photographing them. You know, at first I was like, can I take a picture? And then they're like, yeah, sure. So I took one picture and then I, I just stuck around, like, you know, don't walk away, don't run away from a situation. Um, stick around, hang out, talk with them, take some more pictures, see what unfolds, you know? Um, so again, there's several um, from this interaction that I ended up taking. And, you know, um, the reason I chose this one is because I feel it tells the story well, you know, you have the hydrant, you have the sign, you have the shopping cart, um, you know, uh, and then they're waiting for cars to drive by. You have the cars in the foreground, you have the street. Um, and yeah, it's just classic, uh, you know, Bronx ingenuity to make, a, make, make a, make a little money for the summer, you know, next. Uh, shady tabloids. Um, so I, I used to live on Third Avenue, 149th Street. Um, it's also called the Hub in the Bronx, um, and you know a lot of people consider it the Times Square. What Times Square was back then, you know, is the Hub now, kind of. Um, you know, it's very busy. It's a five-point intersection. It's very gritty. There's a lot of stores, a lot of gates, a lot of train stations and buses, and people are commuting and hustling and bustling. And this image in particular was taken at like 6 or 7 a.m. Everyone was on their way to work. This was super early on um, in my career, like 2012, 2013, when I first picked up a camera and I was like, I need to do street photography in the Bronx. Um, and, you know, it... <laughs> It's like, it's got the energy of this intersection. It's got like a movement, like if you were like in, uh, like in, a, in another country almost, but it's New York City. Like if you were like in, in Nigeria or Lagos or, uh, or any busy intersection, um, you know, this, that's the energy there. And er there's like conversations, commutes, deals going on, transactions, you know, and, this newspaper guy was always there um, and he always had like a, uh, like he, who's, I, he would see me several times and, you know, he wouldn't trust me, you know, he'd be like, who's, what's this guy up to? Is he like a cop or something, you know? Um, so I just thought it was kind of fitting with the, with the news headlines as well. And like his overall reaction posture um, and it kind of, it's an image that tells the energy of the street, right? Um, and a lot of New Yorkers see this, you know, and they, uh, they embrace it. They live with it. it. They just, it's a part of everyday life. Um, so yeah, let's go with, with another one. Um, oh, this is, so, you know, this is a, a second set, a second image from that title card where the kids are jumping into the water. This was like the kids when they first got there and they were just hanging out. You know, um, they rode their bikes there. Um, and, you know, this image, you know, although I was older, I instantly related to this image because that's something 
I, w- I probably wouldn't have jumped into the water as a kid, but I would have been hanging out there just like that, sitting there with my hands, my, my, my elbows on my knees and like, you know, like it just feels like a moment that I've lived before and I was connecting through with these kids. Um, it was just very authentic and it wasn't, it's a slice of the Bronx that a lot of people don't see. You know, when you hang out enough and you explore unexplored areas and you aren't afraid to engage and interact with people, you find yourself making and taking images that just that just really stand out and feel intimate in a way, you know. Um, 161st Street, the Grand Concourse. Um, again, um, you know, I chose this image. It's very iconic. It gives it gives us like, you know, a little bit of everything going on in the street. This was taken during a particular street fair, um, and it just shows what New York City is all about. For anyone across the world who wants to come and visit, to anyone who's a resident and you know, and a native, like you know, they know this scene. I again, this scene is also about the space too, right? And people just fall into it, like. I went to school around the corner, high school around the corner. Um, this was right by the Grand Concourse, right by the Yankee Stadium. Um, you know, there's a lot of traffic that flows through amongst the old buildings. And you got the Bronx Supreme Court, you know, just left to the, to the left of the frame here. Um, so, yeah, I like to shoot in black and white. And, you know, at, at times of day where, like, the contrast is high, you'll see shadows. Um, on the ground and and it's just like a black and white that's uh that's crisp and and well defined um yeah next uh boogie down on fox street well you know i chose to include this image to quickly talk about because you know big part of the bronx it's the birthplace of hip-hop um so music and hip-hop are you know um inextricably linked to the energy and the flow of the South Bronx and, and the summer, right? So um, there's a lot of block parties and there's a lot of uh, uh, festivals, you know, and this was, this was a block party in front of Casita Maria, I think. Um, it was a community center back then. Um, and they were organizing this for the kids to come out. And this was a really good competitive dance group that came through and just you know, had the crowd moving and got kids involved. And, um, you know, it, I, it's, it's just, uh, it's just an, another iconic moment in the Bronx. That's that this one's about the music, um, and the festival and, and hip hop. So, and break dancing. Um, this is another way, and you'll see this, you know, throughout my work, uh, this image is not so much about space, but how it's used intimately. Um, this was on a New York City bus. Um, and New York City buses were often crowded. You know, you can't make this image anywhere else or on any other kind of bus that's not as crowded because you'll look like a weirdo. Um, <laughs> like if there aren't people standing around and just like in a New York City bus, everybody's on top of each other, right? So. I was just standing there holding on to the pole. Um, the bus was commuting and it had a wide lens on me. And uh, when you turn that wide lens uh, vertically, you know, you really get a chance. I'm surprised my shoes aren't in the shot. Um, so as this was happening, the light was filtering in through the windows as this bus is driving, you know, my camera's already around my neck. All I had to do is turn it to the side and grab this image. Um, it's just the unique point of view that's very specific and surprising to New, to New York City. Um, that's also intimate, right? Like, you know, when you're photographing the city, you're looking for moments that are, are intimate. That's not just another street shop, but like, what's look a little bit harder. You know, this is a fixed moment in time that isn't going to happen again. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we photograph, right? Is to, uh, to, to capture something in a singular moment um, that's likely not gonna happen again. So 
this is one of those many moments that I've been very fortunate to capture. Um, and it continues to happen. And it's like, uh, you'll continue to see it pop up, you know, even as you're taking a train, if you, one of the biggest regrets is not having your camera with you. Cause you'll see something, think about it. And like, it just goes by and it's gone. And by the time you've reacted, it's, it's done. So, um, yeah, those are the, you know, those are some of my images, um, photographing the summer in the Bronx. Um, it's something that I still do. I know that this is says till 2016, but I'm still photographing the Bronx in this way. Um, you know, I'll be there this weekend out and about shooting the streets, walking around, hanging out, um, interacting with people. Thank you so much though for letting me chat for a little bit about, you know, in detail about each photograph. Well, they're stunning images, Edwin. And, and I, actually, I, I think maybe the first question I want to ask you is actually about that, that couple on the bus, because I think, you know, the other image that you showed in the set uh, and another one that's in, in the show, which you didn't show, which I'll describe in a second, are really about intimacy in a very crowded, big, busy city, right? And um, the, the boys sitting at the river edge, too just chilling um, is another one. And I, I'm just curious about that level of intimacy. The other photograph that I was referring to that you didn't um, show uh, this afternoon, but is in the photo uh, shot, uh, is in the photo exhibit and people should go back and look at it is a, is a man praying um, inside his uh, shop. And there's a woman standing outside waiting just standing against the wall. And I don't think they have any relationship to each other, but there's something <laughs> deeply intimate about their both introspection and that they're doing something very private yeah. in the middle of this crowded, busy city. And so I'm yeah. just curious about, uh, you talked a little bit about this, but how do you think about that intimacy in the chaos of the city um, and the Bronx in particular? Um, and how you, uh, are you looking for those kinds of photographs or are they moments that you just grab? It kind of go both, it kind of goes both ways. Like, you know, I feel like when you're out shooting, um, you know, you get tired of your own work sometimes and you start seeing the same thing. So you're like, what else, what more? And these are the kind of moments that you can't really replicate. So you start to develop a keen eye for moments of intimacy where humans are displaying, you know, an interaction that's like, ooh, that's different. Ooh, that's different. Why are they doing that? You know, and and it's a, you know, it's 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 a voyeurism that's that's like very just like interested in like how people are being kind to each other. You know, um, uh, seeing past the chaos. Once you spend a lot of time looking at the chaos. You start seeing past it and, and, and you get to see a little bit of what's really there. Um, and I think that's one thing we all have in common. You know, we all love New York, um, its history and everything it represents. And, and um, I'm sure a lot of folks love to just walk around and, and, you know, spend time in our city, not necessarily doing something, right? Because we're always going to a job, going to uh, meet a friend for lunch or going to a place or like everything's go, go, go. But if you ever like stop for a second, just look around, um, you know, and those are some of the most rewarding images, you know, because uh, they're not always there. So you have to look for people who are interacting outside of just the day to day commute. You know, you have to you have to pay attention to, um, you know, if there's someone lingering or or hanging out or loitering and sometimes you paying attention to them means you're like you're also getting involved in interacting. So, you know, I think that's that's uh, an important part in telling the story of New York is showing that, um, you know, the human element, um, you know, in how folks interact in the space. Yeah, well, we're all so close together all the time, right? <laughs> yeah, you're always on display, like the shot yeah. with, the, you know, the, 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 the person praying while the lady's waiting outside, like that's partly because his store is like, I don't know, like 50 square feet or something and it's all <laughs> glass. So he can't, he probably can't do it behind the counter. So he's going to close the door to his store, like do it right where customers usually go. Um, right. You know, so it's, that's the thing. It's like, uh, 
doesn't matter if you're on display. It doesn't matter if you're crowded. New Yorkers are going to be New Yorkers. They're going to live the life they live, you know. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So I want to step back a little bit and talk about the collection. And I guess, you know, your story is very moving about how you started photographing this while you were covering uh, murders in the Bronx in your own neighborhood for the New York Times. And I guess I, I'm curious about how you began to think about it as a collection of photographs. Did it, it, do they start just like you, you're just photographing or do you set off on an artistic project wanting to photograph um, uh, you know, a normal life um, uh, or, or does the sort of idea of the collection of photographs emerge from the photographs themselves? That's, that's a great question. Um... It's, it's a process, right? So it all starts with dabbing in a little bit and then, um, and then exploring it further and further. So um, I guess like it first started with uh, me dabbling into New York City street photography and realizing, you know, Manhattan was over like there's there's a lot of folks doing Manhattan you know and I was like okay well how can I tell a more intimate story of this like where am I from I'm from the Bronx you know so I was like I'm gonna just travel to the Bronx like even at the time when I first started photographing Manhattan I was living in Manhattan I started commuting to the Bronx on purpose you know and so I finally moved there um and yeah it was a slow process of me uh you know, going up there, photographing, becoming a better artist, learning. Street photography is one of the most complex of mediums, you know. It's something that a lot of people can do. It's very inclusive. Anyone can pick up an iPhone camera or um, any, any camera, really. A film camera, an entry-level camera, a large format camera, a movie camera, and do street photography. But to do it well is very challenging because there's a lot of factors that you don't necessarily control. Um and you, it's, it's, it's labor, right? Like you're walking around a lot. Um, you're standing around a lot, um, you know, uh, and you kind of just have to power through it. So I continued doing that. I kept fine tuning my eye. Um, I, you know, I, that's how I, it's through the street photography project in the Bronx that I found the Bronx documentary center. I was just walking by one day and I saw them setting up shop and, and, uh, you know, and it was through there that I, 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 I guess I also found like mentorship or, or artists that I, I started to really look up to. Um, they were setting up an exhibition for Seis del Sud, which is a group of, uh, you know, six New Yorican photographers that documented the Bronx in the 70s and 80s. And I was like, oh my gosh, here I am doing this very thing. And here are guys who had done it before me. And, and they're not as mainstream as other photographers. And and they have a very similar experience to me. And there's so much undeveloped work there that I haven't gotten a chance to explore. So, you know, I it started taking shape slowly. The first year, I still didn't even know that it was a project. I, again, I was just practicing and doing. Um, and as I started learning about their work, studying it a bit more and fine tuning my work, I, then I'd say like in the last two years, the last year, I was only on assignment covering crime for the New York Times for a year. It was a year long series, particularly mm -hmm. that one. Um, and that year was 2016, I think. That's the year where I really started to like, I knew what I wanted. So I would go out there, boom, 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 hang out on this corner, talk to these people, go over there, go over here, you know, and, and, uh, and you start getting better and better and you start gaining momentum and then it becomes a body of work. Um, and even piecing this stuff together because I shot year round, right? So there isn't any winter stuff in here. This is very summer centric. So it was challenging at times because it's like, wow, I have three years, four years of work and it's like all seasons and like so many angles you can go here when you're like putting it together down into one. And the idea is, you know, I want the people to feel like they were in the Bronx. They could feel the streets, smell the summer, you know, feel the heat. Um, you know. Yeah, and you could definitely feel the heat. I mean, I, I grew up in the Bronx, too, as you know, in Soundview, and um, I've seen many of those scenes many, many times myself, and you capture them beautifully. And I think that that um, 
you know, the open hydrant, for instance, you, you know what that feels like, the heat coming off the sidewalk and, and your photographs really elicit that reaction. And I think it would elicit that reaction from anybody, even if you didn't live in the Bronx or, or know New York City, because I think that you've captured that sensation so accurately that, that um, if people, people feel it. I certainly felt it. <laughs> no question about it. So we actually have a few questions that were sort of overlapping with one that I wanted to ask about, uh, and you mentioned this a little bit uh, about using black and white photographs. And I, I also wanna call out the texture in your photographs because I think that they're very tactile. It, it feels like there's tons of texture in them. And um, so we have a couple of, so I wanted to ask about that, but we have a couple of questions that relate to this. So I'm gonna share them with you and then maybe you can attack them any way you wish. Um, and someone uh, says that you do black and white work extraordinarily well, uh, extraordinarily well. Do you actually shoot in black and white or shoot in color and then convert? Um, to preserve the midtone ranges they're, they're asking. Um, and then someone else also asked whether you ever shoot in color. Um, so interested in your responses to any and all of this. Sure. Um, so yeah, the tactile look is something that took me a while to find. Like when you just, a lot of it's shot on film, most of it, um, I think almost all of it. Um, you know, if you just buy regular Kodak, D70s, uh, you know, Kodak Triax or Ilford HP5, um, they're contrasty, but they're not enough to distinguish a different kind of look. So it took me a while to experiment, just searching. Um, I really wanted something gritty. Um, so I started pushing the film, shooting it at a higher ISO than it was rated at. I also used a special developer that you know, uh, produced very contrasty, gritty images and also lasted forever. Rodinol, um, great developer. Um, I'm sure I have this much left in my basement and it's still good, you know, it's like, um, and it's just, it's a harsh developer. It's not something you would use for fine, you know, studio work or advertising or anything that, you know, like it, it's the opposite, right. With film, you know, and, and, um, and, it's, it's kind of like the look that I wanted, you know, um, why black and white? Because I, so I shoot to answer that. That's all black and white. I also make prints, um, black and white removes, uh, color and allows you to just focus on shapes. Um, I like to shoot in the middle of the day, uh, which, you know, color doesn't do well then anyways, because, the light is just so harsh. Um, you don't really get to experience the full color. Um, and it's, it's just a different way of, uh, of thinking. I feel less pressure, you know, I, 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 even though I'm shooting film, I'm also photographing very quickly and not thinking so much, just letting gut instinct respond and react and, and, um, and keeping things simple allows you to like, you know, um, work more creatively within those boundaries. Um, of course, I shoot color. I've been a professional photographer now for uh, at least 10 years. And, you know, you have to shoot color professionally um, for like assignment work. Um, so, but a lot of my personal work um, has always been black and white. I fell in love with black and white back in college when I was taking a cinema studies course. And I told my professor, I wanted to learn how to make a film, a short film. And he was like, take us analog class and learn. And boom, everything changed. Once you start seeing the light coming out of the paper, like the, the image coming out of the paper, once it's exposed to light and dipped in the chemistry, um, it's like, wow, this is like writing, but with light, you know, it's, uh, it's really cool in that regard. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I've um, done a little bit of uh, photography in my own life. And, and uh, I think you love every stage of the image. You love the way the it looks uh, in, in negative form. You love how it comes out of the tray <laughs> and the images. And you're always trying to perfect that. Yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, so I, it, you talked a little bit about the work that you do uh, in your in your other non-artistic life uh, as a professional, and I'm just curious 
Um, uh, you obviously have done a lot of photography, both photojournalism, but also uh, photography for politicians and, and in a political um, environment where you're uh, uh, sort of doing more stage stuff. And I'm wondering whether there's, whether there's influence back and forth across those platforms or whether your artistic work is over there and your professional um, uh, journalistic work and your, your uh, you know, more stage political work is over there, whether yeah. they're separate or influence each other. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, okay, so a few things. Uh, Photojournalism is very challenging. Um, photographing breaking news and you know uh, crime and homicides. You know the New York Times is doing an in-depth report, so a lot of it was long-form journalism. So you know after someone had died, I found myself having to connect with the family um, long-term, which was really challenging. There was a lot of no's um, and dealing with rejection and no's as you're a vulnerable artist as well is uh, is not easy. I don't know how I developed the thick skin to like muster it through. Even thinking back, I'm like, man, like I still can't believe like you take so many no's and just keep going and keep trying. A lot of that stems from just passion and driving you through. Um, so, you know, I say that to say that my career in government politics, you know, started because of my work as a street photographer and as a photojournalist, actually. Like I recall the director of creative communication saying, hey, we want someone like you to join our team as a photographer. And that felt, I was like, have you seen my body of work? Like, <laughs> I don't really usually photograph uh, politicians, you know? Um, and, he, and he was like, yeah, well, anyone can photograph, you know, a politician, but can you tell the story of New Yorkers, you know? And can you bring that talent um, and that understanding and perspective to the team and stuff? And and I, at the time, too, I was completely like, I wasn't really interested in government and politics. Like, I would never, you know, do this. But because of what he said, um, you know, and also while I ended up working there, it, I was really given a lot of, like, agency to, um, to, like, engage and tell the stories of New Yorkers, photograph those elements. Um, you know, and, and honestly, after dealing with like the rejection of, you know, photographing someone who, you know, uh, was experiencing a really hard moment, you know, in, in a crime or a homicide story and then engaging with their family and, and having to um, convince them to say, hey, look, I know I'm a news photographer and I'm here in one of your most devastating moments, but I also want to tell your story if you want to tell it you know, and this is an opportunity to do it. I'm not some paparazzi who's just going to take pictures. I want to be respectful. So navigating that and then navigating politics and government was like a cakewalk, you know, <laughs> it, was like, it was like, you know, once you deal with New Yorkers like that on that kind of level, um, you know, I was already very adept and very mobile on my feet and I could move quickly and engaging with people in that sense and over communicating was a uh, skills that I had learned and was just something very critical to like the day-to-day -day flow. So it made it feel like a cakewalk. Um, and it was, it was, it, it was nice because it felt like, uh, you know, I finally found a job as a photographer and I felt like I was contributing to something greater than just myself too. So, um, yeah, I guess that's the, uh, that's the difference, or I guess that's how, that, that's the connection is that they actually wanted my perspective, you know, in that kind of job, which was cool. Yeah, no, absolutely. That's extraordinary, actually. That's a credit, to, a credit to them and a credit to you to come into that world and really take it seriously. That's, that's fantastic. Um, we have, by the way, someone uh, sh shouted out a lovely compliment. They loved your writing with light. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, so there are a couple of other people uh, were asking questions. Um, you mentioned life on 140 40th Street, and they were wondering um, if you thought about, I think, the Manhattan and Bronx connection, 140th Street to 42nd, um, maybe comparisons. Um, someone was asking about that. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's actually a really good idea. I, I, it's something. It's one of my like 
talking points every time I talk about the hub, 149th Street and 3rd Avenue and 42nd Street Times Square? Have I ever thought about photographing them in some sort of parallel relationship body of work? I haven't, but I know now. Thank you. For <laughs> <laughs> no, it, I have. I have photographed, obviously, Times Square extensively. I've never looked at the work alongside each other. I just, Third Avenue, 149th Street doesn't have all the shiny billboards and signs and, and uh, hotels, but the grind is there. The people making deals, transactions, commuting, who knows what's going on, you know? Everybody's <laughs> doing something. It's there, yeah. I mean, and and that's something to look forward to and to look out for. And in fact, uh, you know, it's it'll be a really interesting project idea too, if not for me, but for someone maybe who's in the crowd, who's passionate about this stuff, you know, to go and photograph as well, because I'd personally be discouraged by all the shiny signs. And I'm like, this isn't the Bronx, you know, right, let me go back. Let me hop on the train back. Um, Cause the Bronx, the, the hub doesn't have all that money, you know, it's just, it's old school. It's like, so if, if there was a direct comparison, it would be like Times Square, like, you know, in the sixties, you know, uh, where it was just storefront signs and stuff like that. It wasn't like, you know, shiny billboards and uh, yeah. digital advertisements, and new businesses and stuff. But the grit is still there because it's like where there's money, people go. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think, you know, uh, what the way you describe that feels very much like I kind of think about New York City as having these these high streets, these places where the, the sort of neighborhood hub happens, as you've described it for 149th Street. And and, um, you know, there there's a lot more similarity between them, perhaps, than than Times Square. <laughs> Uh, that might that might be an interesting project too. Uh, someone also asked you, um, uh, obviously a fellow uh, Colby College uh, uh, person oh. wanted to, wanted to know whether you have ever documented your whether you documented your college experience. Um, obviously, you were inspired to, to be a photographer, maybe in some of your college experiences. But they were curious whether you would photographed uh, while you were there. I. Um, well, shout out to Kobe because I mean, there aren't that many <laughs> times you've run into people because it's such a small school. Um, so whoever you are, thanks. Um, you know, it was a very different experience, obviously, um, going to a really small liberal arts school in Maine, uh, from the Bronx. And it's something that I grappled with it was challenging the first year because I was just so different. Um, but I started to really love it. Um, after that first year, I just stuck it through and I met some of the most incredible people. I had the greatest education experiences. Um, I didn't photograph it. I made a short film uh, as a senior at Kobe about my experience. Um, and it's not a very good short film. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing because I was learning, but it's called A Higher Education. And, and actually it was my senior, uh, it was one of my senior electeds. I took a screenwriting class before, so I like wrote a script, I storyboarded. I tried to like reimagine the whole filmmaking process as much as I can do by myself. You know, I bought the camera, I was shooting, I had a little film crew. We had two days shooting in the Bronx where I like recreated myself in high school before I got my acceptance letter to Colby. And then we had two days shooting in Maine, Waterville. You know, I was part of the crew team there. So there's like a scene where I convinced the coach on the crew team to like let us film as we were like rowing <laughs> on, a, on the lake, you know. Um, man, we went through quite the lengths for that. Um, and we premiered it on campus. Well, it was a class. So, you know, I, you know, really, uh, really did that up. But um, yeah, that was that that was part of like my fundamental learning process. And um and also one of the reasons why I moved towards photography, because I was realizing with filmmaking, you really need a crew to do it correctly, you know? Yeah. It's a bigger, it's a team sport <laughs> as opposed to a solitary sport, right? Um, well, maybe this is a good time to talk a little bit, uh, since you've already started talking about a little bit about, you know, who are your idols in this world? It, it, um, you know, who are the people you've looked to uh, as you've tried to think through your own work and um, who do you most admire? Oh, 
who do I most admire? The people that I think about. Um, there's so many great uh, photographers. I'm a big fan of photo books. Um, you know, I try to get as many of them as I can. I just like looking through images. Um, obviously, um, you know, there's the more popular names like Gordon Parks, but some of the not as well-known names. Um, uh, oh, I'm, not, I'm not about to go grab my photo book right now. <laughs> I was like, let me go grab this book. Um, uh, David Gonzalez, Angel Franco, they were both Puerto Rican, New York Times. Angel Franco was a photojournalist for the New York Times for 25 years. At one point, I was photographing Murder in the 4-0. That was the homicide series that we were working on alongside him. And I learned a lot from him. Um, David Gonzalez was a columnist. Um, I would always send him my assignments. And I'm like, what do you think about this? How, how do you think I did? Do you think they're going to hire me again? Because I was a freelancer, right? So I was really working my myself off to like get called again. You're only as good as your last job kind of thing. Um, let's see. Um, Joe Conzo, he's a, uh, you know, if, if you don't know about Joe Conzo, he's, he's pretty much considered like the hip hop photographer, you know, so he, he has a really interesting body of work uh, to check out. He photographed New York City in some incredible ways. Um, and uh, some, just some like, you know, celebrities and, and the scene behind it. Um, uh, Ricky Flores, th those are all Say Stel Sooth photographers. Um, but I guess like in college, it was Gordon Parks for me at first, you know, mm -hmm. he was the, he was the person who I saw, um, you know, telling, uh, real stories in a very real way, black and white. So, yeah, yeah. stunning, stunning, stunning photographs of very also kind of intimate life, uh, scenes in many cases, I'm not his most classic works, but I think the works that I like, I like the most are those very intimate. Um, yeah, that's, um, it started with Gary Winogran actually, um, with like photographing quickly and photographing the street. Mm -hmm. but then Gordon Parks was like, okay, there's a way to make this intimate, you know? Right. I felt his work was more intimate. That's um, an interesting evolutionary connection that I hadn't made, but it makes yeah. sense. It makes sense to me. So what are you working on now? Any artistic projects that you're working on now? Um, I've been photographing my family for the better part of seven years, eight years. It's something I'm still working on. Um, I think it. I'm attracted to intimacy and images. I think it's very different than you know what we choose to show. I feel like we live in a social media world where people are always showing like their greatest moments. And the thing I love about this project is that it's so raw and candid and and, you know, and yeah, it takes a lot for me to show a very intimate image related to my family, but anyone else will see it be like, oh, I can relate to that. But like, I can't see, I don't see that many other photographs like it. So, um, so, you know, recently, I, and that's a project that started early on in college. It took a couple of portraits of my family members on large format film and in color when I was just learning about it. And I decided to continue it in black and white film. Um, and that's kind of just like, you know, I had a family photo album, documentary photographs, uh, body of work. Um, I had a show, a solo exhibition recently on that. That was pretty big. Um, and yeah, just getting ready for the next stage of life. You know, we have a we have a little one on the way. So there'll be plenty of baby pictures on the on the Instagram and stuff coming up soon. So. Well, they'll be pretty fantastic baby pictures, I suspect. A little, <laughs> a little different than your average bear. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, that's fantastic. And is that uh, the solo show um, that you mentioned? Is that still open? Can people still see it? Oh, or? no, no, no. 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 I, I came down. But, um, but yeah, hopefully there'll be another one. I mean, that's like my body of work right now that I'm like circulating, showing to people, trying to get it more and more seen. So. And that's, well, that's on our website as a, you know, a, there's the tribute to South Bronx, somewhere in the Bronx, and there's like me family. So it's like I photograph my family and my town in Puerto Rico and my town in the Bronx. It's all interconnected in a way, you know? 
Yeah. Well, um, maybe we could, uh, why don't you share your website link and we'll put it in the chat so everybody can click on it um, and uh, take a look at that body of work as well. So you can just sure. say it out loud and we can, I'm sure. I will. Yeah, it's like, edwintorrespf.com um, and I just like threw it in the chat too. So oh, great. Fun. Okay, great. Uh, Fantastic. But yeah, no, I, you know, it's, it's an ongoing thing, you know, and uh, finding new ways to show New York City is, is exciting. Oh, something else I'll, ha I'll be having, um, I actually have like a semi-permanent body of work at the Bronx Children's Museum. Um, it's like these massive life-size black and white images of kids in the Bronx that are on the walls. It's not like, it's not like, uh, it's not like just a photograph or something on the wall. It's like, the wall itself is like so it's really cool um there's going to be a reception next wednesday uh that i'll be here on the 28th of june um and i guess they're just going to start opening this up to the public and everyone so you know i'm happy to share that info with uh but bronx children's museum if you google it check them out online. which just I'm opened sure. right it's relatively it's new open. yeah yeah, um, and they've been an incredible partner that I've been working with. I'm really looking forward to just working with the kids there and visiting frequently and just continuing to photograph the place I love. Well, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Edwin. We really appreciate your taking the time to share with all of us uh, your, um, your thoughts about your own work. And we couldn't wish you more, uh, more luck as you go forward. The, the images are stunning. And I really do urge people to look at the, the rest of his work as well, because it's equally moving. And um, obviously, um, his family work in particular is uh, not perhaps on the MAS theme, but absolutely worthy of, of viewing. So please, please do. Um, I think uh, we should probably start to close up here. So I want to thank all my colleagues for coordinating today's program. And uh, thank you all for join, joining us today uh, for this um, uh, for this gallery talk, uh, virtual gallery talk. Uh, and special thanks to our MAS members. If you're not a member and enjoyed today's program, we hope that you'll consider joining. Your membership helps support uh, um, MAS programs and advocacy towards a livable city. Um, uh, and we uh, really count on uh, this, our supporters for that. And we hope to see you in an upcoming tour or a program. Uh, we have a handful of virtual um, in-person book talks coming up later this summer, so stay tuned for those details. And we'll also uh, want to invite you, if you have not seen the announcement, um, we are uh, seeking nominations for the 2023 uh, Masterworks Design Awards. Um, think of your favorite new architecture or design projects in New York that were completed last year in 2022. The open call is now open and will be uh, open through March, July, uh, excuse me, Monday, July 3rd, not, not March. <laughs> Anyone can make a nomination. So please celebrate your favorite building or park today and fill out a submission form. Thank you. Uh, you will find the details in the chat. And thank you so much for joining us. We're very grateful for you sharing your time with us today. And uh, thank you again, Edwin and everyone um, for making this such a lively conversation. Thank Take you. Care. So Take care.